We've been talking about Christ's claim of divinity and proofs of it. So this time we've, we've looked at his character, and um, this time we're going to look at how his works prove his divinity. So uh, basically we're going to be talking about the miracles of Christ and his resurrection. Um, remember we talked about miracles and what they were. Miracles are marvelous works. They're out of the ordinary course of nature. Out of the ordinary course of nature. Something that nature can't do by itself. They, and so they're, because of they're out of the ordinary course of nature, they can only be produced by Almighty God. The devil cannot do the miracles. The devil can only do things, make, he can do wonderful looking things. He can make things, you know, marvelous events, but they're all, he, can, he can't do anything that nature can't. He could make lightning strike right here because lightning is a natural phenomenon and he can cause that. He can bring a wind out of nowhere or raise up a dust storm. All that is natural, but he can't do anything outside. <coughs> anything that nature can't produce, the devil can't produce. So he can't give life to an inanimate body. He can't create life. He can't, um, he can't raise the dead to life. So, now when we look at uh, these marvelous events, the first things we have to look at are, are two things. One is that, is it outside of nature? And that's what we call uh, that, and if it is, we call that, that is its philosophical truth. It is something that only Almighty God could do. Um, the, other, the other part of it is, is it actually a, 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 a wonderful event, a, a marvelous event that needs to be explained, in which case it's a, well, that's its historical truth. So miracles have two truths, a historical truth and a philosophical truth. If they have both of them, then we, well, we can look at it. <coughs> we can look at it and say, the finger of God is here. This has to have been uh, done by Almighty God or blessed by Almighty God. And so that's what we have to look at when we look at the miracles. Christ wrought true miracles, marvelous events. And therefore the doctrine, he, he, he wrought these events to prove his doctrine and also to prove who he was. To, to verify his claim. His, and because these are miracles, and we can show that they are miracles, and we will show that they are miracles, this proves that his claim is true, and that his doctrine is true. His character is true God, and his mission as man's redeemer, that's what he came for. Those two things. To show that he was true God, and to redeem mankind. Therefore, the miracles of Christ show unmistakably first that he that God approved his, him, and and God approved that his claim that he was God, and God also approved his mission as redeemer. <coughs> so now the Gospels mention hundreds of cases of miracles that are Lord performed. And these miracles can't be questioned on the score of historical truth because, first of all, Christ performed all these miracles in public. Every miracle our Lord performed, there were witnesses. And usually not just one witness. In the case of some miracles, 5,000 witnesses. When he, when he multiplied loaves and fishes. 2,000. He did it twice. Once 5,000 people, once 2,000 people. Um, and also, you can, all these, these witnesses were not all friends of our Lord. So it wasn't like people 
backing up, yeah, you did it, and we're all your friends, and yeah, well, we, we back you up. No, a lot of his enemies <coughs> were there and witnessed these miracles. And they were all, these, these enemies were looking for an opportunity to, to downplay the power of Christ. To, to prove that he wasn't who he said he was. And they would have jumped on, on these miracles and tried to, and if, they weren't, if they weren't valid, if they weren't historically accurate, if they didn't happen, <coughs> or if they could in any way show that there was a problem with them. Um, they never denied that Lazarus rose from the dead, for example. They didn't deny that he rose from the dead. Uh, they didn't deny that he could drive out devils. They just said, oh, but it's by the devil that he drives out devils. They didn't, they didn't deny that he drove them out. And then our Lord had to point out to them, that's totally illogical. Why would the devil want to drive himself out? Um, so, so when Christ raised Lazarus from the dead, they didn't deny it. They simply turned around and plotted to kill Christ or to kill Lazarus to prove that, oh, well, it was a fluke. You know, it was just a temporary thing. He was like a walking mannequin or something that just dropped over dead the next day. And um, yeah. So the, the Pharisees were very watchful what our Lord did, and they were very careful. And so. If modern man thinks that the watchful Pharisee, <laughs> if if the watchful Pharisees were, uh, if modern man thinks that the watchful Pharisees were deluded by Christ, then modern man is sadly deluded in what the, uh, about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were not were were looked out to get him. And there is a theory out there, it's, uh, it's, it's called the delusion theory, and that is so totally absurd. Um, and, and if you subscribe to that theory, it forces the conclusion that the Jews of Christ, that they, you could come up with the idea that the Jews of Christ's times were, were obviously morons or imbeciles. If you believe, if, in other words, the theory says that they were delusional, that they couldn't they, they didn't, they were like, it was like mass hypnosis that, that our Lord just pulled, was, was such a trickster that, and they bought the whole thing. <coughs> First of all, that's a lot of people, 5,000 people at one sitting, you know, uh, to, to, well, that's probably the mass hypnosis point. Yeah. Um, in other words, if you subscribe to that theory, the Jews were obviously morons in this. But they weren't. They weren't. And maybe you might have had a couple of them in there, but that a huge number, all the Jews and all the people who ever saw our Lord, his enemies and friends alike. So let's just look at two of the miracles, Lazarus and the man born blind, and see if, if how delusional they, this could not be. <coughs> this, this is totally illogical. So the raising of Lazarus from the dead, that's, that's an indisputable historical truth. When Martha and Mary sent for Christ, Lazarus, they sent for him because Lazarus was dead. Christ purposely, purposely delayed coming. He delayed until he knew that Lazarus was dead before he came. Why? Because he knew the will of God and he knew what he needed to do, which was to raise Lazarus from the dead. Well, you can't raise someone from the dead unless they're dead. So he purposely waited to come, and he waited a long enough time that Lazarus was, there was no disputing the fact that Lazarus was dead. That was the important point. Lazarus was already in the tomb four days when Christ shows up. Four days in the tomb. Uh, when Lazarus came forth from the tomb, he would, they had to loosen his bond because the way the way the Jews bury you, they wrap you in cloth with a lot of spices, 
And they put bands around you to tie your, your legs, your knees, your upper thighs, across your waist, uh, the, a cloth over your head. Uh, there's actually two cloths over your head. And um, that's tied around your neck, another one around this way to keep your chin up. So they, so with all the spices and all of this cloth, and four days in the tomb, which is sealed, he was suffocating. If he wasn't already dead, if he just was unconscious in a coma, <coughs> appeared to be dead, and was put in the tomb, he would have suffocated. And the same can be said of our Lord when we get to the resurrection. Because there are those who claim that he, was not, he wasn't dead when they put him in the tomb. He would have been dead by the third day. If he wasn't dead within the first few hours. Um, so, the miracle was also performed in open daylight in front of a lot of witnesses, again, many of whom were not friends of our Lord. Christ called upon the dead man, and Lazarus arose and came forth. There was certainly no delusion <coughs> in this miracle. The people saw it. The Pharisees admitted to it. No one, including the chief priests, even doubted it. If this, was a, if this miracle is not justified here historically, then there's no value to human history at all. If you want to deny that this actually happened, then you also have to deny the American Revolution, the Civil War, because then there can't be any true history. Facts are facts. And you just can't write them off because you dislike them or they don't fit your agenda. The, the cure of the man born blind is also a certain historical fact. And the way it happened was that on the Sabbath day, and it's important that it was the Sabbath day, Jesus passing by saw a man who was blind from birth. Blind from birth. He was not, the blindness didn't come on him gradually, like with glaucoma or something else like that. He didn't hit his head and lose his sight, the way some people have, you know, that is often caused, you know, damage to the, the nerves. And, but also, oftentimes another blow to the head will bring back your sight. This man was born blind. That's a, a, another important point. Our Lord made <coughs> clay from, with his, with, from, Dirt from the ground, it's his fiddle. And he um, put the, it on the man's eyes and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man went, the man washed, and the man could see. The man, um, the people were confused when they saw him. After, after he came away from the pool of Siloam, he could see, and everybody could notice that he could see. You know, if you ever look into a the face of a blind man and a person who can see, their eyes are very different. Uh, uh, blind men do not focus. And, and that lack of focus in your eyes gives you kind of like a glassy look. Um, that's why a lot of blind men wear glasses. They don't need the glasses. They don't need the, you know, when it's, or the sun shades either. <coughs> they, wear. they just don't want you looking in their eyes because it annoys us and it annoys them. So um, they looked at this man and they said, is this the man born blind? They were confused. He looks like him, but this doesn't seem to be the same guy. So um, he said that he was. He admitted, I, I was. I was blind. And uh, someone carried me. So they took him to the priest and the Pharisee, who asked him how he got his sight back. And he explained to them over and over again. Uh, the, Pharisee the Pharisee said, this is not God, God because he doesn't, he doesn't keep that. He cured on the Sabbath. But others said, how can a sinner do such But if he's not God, then he's a sinner. And if, because he broke the Sabbath. But how can a sinner do such a thing? Remember, it's a miracle. And miracles testify that the finger of God is here. So if this is a sinner, how can he do works for God? And they, they were divided amongst themselves. So they asked the man who was born blind, what did he thought? And he said, he's a prophet. Well, 
He remember, he has not laid eyes on our Lord yet. He was blind when our Lord cured him. Our Lord sent him off to the pool to wash. He's never seen our Lord. The Jews didn't believe that he had ever been blind. All right, so fine. He could, if he couldn't have, he, he couldn't have been blind. Because uh, we have to dispute the fact that Almighty God, because that means this is a miracle. So obviously he couldn't have been blind to begin with. So they called for his parents, and they brought his parents in. And now his parents were afraid of these leaders. You know, these, these guys have a lot of power, and, you know, they, they, were, they were afraid to say the wrong thing. So they said, uh, so they asked him, is this your son? Yeah. Was he born blind? Yes. Well, well, how is it then that he can see? And they said, well, why don't you ask him? <laughs> they don't want to answer. Ask him. Um, so they did. They asked him again. And, but he said he didn't know who, what it was, whether the man who cured him, who he was, whether he was a sinner or not. But he said, can, how could he be a sinner? I know not whether this man is a sinner. I know only one thing, that I was blind and now I see. And so they called him all kinds of names because it, it, to, the, in the Jewish mind, sins, being born blind or having something bad happen to you is a sign that you're, God, you've done something wrong. It's, a, it's, it's punishment for sin. So if you're born blind, either you're very simple, well, you're a baby. How, what sin could you commit? Well, your parents then committed the sin. But you were born already in sin because your parents committed it. Um, so, so they they, they reviled, reviled him, him and, and said, said that they, they um, and they said they, they didn't know where Christ where came, came from, from, meaning whether he, he where Christ was from God or from the devil. And and the man who had been cured says, "What do you mean you don't know where he came from? Why this is a wonderful thing that you know that you don't know from whence he comes because he cured me, he opened my eyes." And we know that God does not hear sinners. But if a man be a server of God and doth his will, he hears him. From the beginning of the world, it has never been known or heard that any man has, who was born blind had his eyes opened. There was never a cure in, in the whole history of the world up till now where someone born blind was cured of it. He's lecturing to the leaders, much braver than his parents. He's lecturing to the to the leaders. How can you say you don't that you think you might be from the devil? If he, how can you said that he's a sinner? Obviously, even if you were a sinner, he's from God. And they, this of course, made them really angry, and they threw him out. Who do you who do you think who do you think you are? What do you think you know? You're you're a sinner. Get, get out of here. Don't come lecture to us. So they threw him out. When our Lord heard that he had been thrown out, our Lord went to him. He didn't come to our Lord. Remember, he doesn't know who our Lord is. Our Lord went to him. And he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? Notice, this is one of the few times our Lord refers to himself as the Son of God. In those words. He refers to himself in other ways. He likes to use really likes to call himself the son of man. But there were a number of times when it was important that he referred that he made his claim, remember we're talking about it, his claim to be the son of God. This is one of those times. He said, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? I don't know him. Who is he? I want to believe in him. And Jesus said to him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And at that, the man understood that this is the man who cured him. And the man replied, I believe, Lord. And he fell down on his knees and adored him. Recognize this is not just somebody working for God. This is God. Notice that the man born blind was unmistakably identified. 
they have called in witnesses to make sure that this was the right God. God is parents. Notice, too, that no one among his neighbors or the Pharisees doubted that the miracle took place. They, and again, they verified the fact the miracle took place by asking his parents, was he born blind? Once they verified that, yes, he had been born blind, well, now we can't refute anything. Yeah, obviously, a miracle took place. The miracle was done publicly, and it was also one of the different from a lot of his other miracles in that our Lord performed the ceremony in um, curing him. It was, the ceremony was meant, at least partially, to call attention to the miracle. But there's another reason for the ceremony, which we'll get to in a minute. So there's no doubt that historically this miracle took place. Now about the philosophical truths of, of these marvels, do they exceed the powers of nature and can and therefore can only be the work of Almighty God? Raising the dead to life is not within the powers of nature. Nature is sometimes termed to give life, but nature can you, you, never gives life to a corpse. Even if nature could restore life, the raising of a dead man at the work of someone, at the word of someone, just being saying the word and then they come to life, it would still be a miracle. Even if nature could do that, that our Lord could come in there and harness nature and by his own word force it to do what he wanted, would in itself be a miracle. <coughs> If nature had hidden power within itself, which brought Lazarus from death to life, then why was that power only exercised when Jesus called Lazarus forth? The work was certainly of God, since it was a work of goodness and kindness, and its effect was one that brought men's minds to God. So it was a good thing. The miracle itself was done for good reasons, and therefore obviously pointed to Almighty God. So we can verify it as a true miracle on both points because it's both historically true and philosophically true. So it's unmistakable evidence that Christ is God and that his doctrine is true. As far as the man born blind, that also is a true miracle because the man who was born blind is evidence that the blindness itself was not caused by any nervous disorder. That he was born blind was again, it couldn't he it was not a hit on the head, it was not a nervous disorder, not autosuggestion, not hypochondria, not a temporary state of where strong faith or sudden hope might dispel it, or another hit on the head. Indeed, the man didn't know who Christ was when he felt the clay placed on his eyes and was set to wash. When he was asked later, he thought that Christ was at least a prophet. Only when our Lord found him was he given the gift of faith. So it wasn't faith that made him, you know, like faith healers, you know, where, you know, you believe enough, you can be cured, you know, stand up and walk, you get out of your way. And sometimes faith will cause people to do things that they thought that they could not do before. But faith, it couldn't be faith here causing this miracle. First of all, he didn't have faith until after he was cured and our Lord, um, told him who he was. And he said, at which point he said, I believe the Lord. No hidden power of nature could account for his restoration vision. If it could, then why did, again, like with Lazarus, why did it wait until the ceremony of the anointing and the washing were performed? Why did it wait for the orders of Christ before it functioned? So we have the philosophical truth of the event of the miracle, 
for it's obviously outside ordinary course of nature. But this miracle was wrought to support the claim that Christ was God and we see from Christ's words to the man, again, because it's one of the times he refers to himself as God, that he's making the claim to be God and therefore that claim is true, that Christ is God. And these are only two of the miracles. I mean, you can go through the, the, the four Gospels and find many, many instances. This Lazarus was not the only one he raised to from the dead. It was the little girl, the daughter of Jairus. There was the widow of Nain's son. Who, and those are the only recounted miracles. Who knows how many others he raised from the dead? The number of devils that he drove, drove out. The number of... Um, the time that he changed water to wine, fish and loaves into bread, fed thousands of people. Um, there's there's tons and tons of miracles. Lame walked, people couldn't hear, people couldn't see, people cured of diseases, leprosy, all kinds of things. So, the, but the greatest of all miracles that our Lord wrought was, of course, the resurrection. It's the crowning miracle of his career because it's more than just a miracle. It was also the fulfillment of prophecy. The next time we will look again, and we will look more, we'll finish up with Christ's next lesson, next lesson where we, his last proofs of divinity, which are that he fulfilled prophecy and also his proof that he is truly man. But this is the greatest fulfillment of prophecy here. Christ made this prophecy many times. After the transfiguration of our Lord, he told the apostles, tell no man till the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Risen from the dead. Verb choice here is very important. Jesus also told the Jews, destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it up. I will raise it. He spoke of the temple of his body, not the temple of the building. And again, he said to his followers, behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and they shall deliver him to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and crucified. And on the third day, he will rise again. He will rise again. Verb choice. The Jewish leaders took note of Jesus' prophecies, even if the apostles and others didn't, to such an extent that after he was dead, they went to Pilate and said, we remember that the seducer said while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. I will rise again. Again, verb choice. Christ was very explicit that he would rise of his own power. That's why that verb choice is important. He uses expressions Till the Son of Man be risen, not raised. Until I be raised from the dead means somebody else is going to do it. I be risen means I will rise by my own power. I will raise it up. I, my power. The third day he shall rise, not be raised again. After three days I will rise again. Each case, he is saying that he will do the rising by his own power, not God raising him from the dead. Regarding this great miracle, two things must clearly be known. First of all, for this to be a miracle, Christ had to have really died. And secondly, Christ had to really have risen from the dead. To, now you think, well, uh, yeah, obviously. No, think about that, because all the objections to Christ's divinity fall into those two things. Christ had to have died, and he had to have risen from the dead. So, did Christ really die? The four evangelists 
testify that Christ died on the cross. Matthew says that he yielded up the ghost, that he died. Um, most of them have used exactly the same words. Some give even more details that back up the fact that he was dead. Mark records that, that the centurion gave Pilate, when, uh, when Pilate wanted to know whether he was dead, the centurion certified that our Lord was truly dead. He certified it. Yeah, he's dead. The soldiers who came to break the legs of the crucified saw that Christ was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. What did they do? They drove a, they drove a lance through his side. If he wasn't dead, now there's no question. They opened his side with a spear, inflicting a wound that would have been sufficient to cause death. Considering Christ went from Galilee to Calvary, and Christ exercised superhuman power to keep himself alive for the whole that whole length of time, he certainly should have died long before the three hours on the cross were up. Considering all that he went through, it's amazing that he even lived the three hours on the cross. He had to use superhuman effort to keep himself alive until he had accomplished everything he wanted on the cross, fulfilled every single prophecy. Then Christ was buried in the usual Jewish manner, rather like Lazarus, with spices, uh, 100 pounds of spices, 100 pounds of spices. That would be enough to suffocate anyone in a, if you put them in a closed-in area with, with that much spices. Bound with linen and shut up in an almost airless tomb. If he were not dead like Lazarus, he would probably have suffocated or died from his untreated wounds because he was in there for 40 hours. Secondly, did Christ really rise from the dead. The apostles bear testimony to the fact. The apostles had nothing to gain by a, this deception. Nor were they men who were even who would even try to deceive anybody. They were scared to death of the Pharisees. That's why they were locked in a room. They locked themselves in the room. They fled from the crucifixion scene. By preaching the resurrection, they placed themselves in danger of persecution and death, and they knew it. Still, they maintained until death, because all of them did die a martyr's death, that Christ had risen by his own power from the dead. They testified to that with their own lives. Nor were the apostles deceived about the resurrection. They were not credulous. They are actually very slow to believe. They had to, they had to verify everything. When the women came to the apostles, Peter and John didn't accept it. They ran to the tomb to look at it with their own eyes so they could come back and report. They, the, um, the other apostles also had need verification. When our Lord appeared, they thought he might be a ghost. Well, so he had to, oh, do you have anything to eat? Uh, you know, so prove to them, I'm a real person, I'll eat with you. Uh, Thomas, come here, Thomas, touch me. Put your finger, again, Thomas wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna believe till he touched him. When our Lord came to the apostles the first time without Thomas there, again, they all touched him. He sat, he ate with them. He let them see that he was truly real. Um, so they, the apostles were not the only witnesses. There were also the holy women, other disciples, the ones going to Emos, who also ate with him. 500 people in Galilee who saw Christ at one time. 500 people all at one time. Uh, this is not just the transfer, the, the <coughs> either. That was another group of people, all a lot of people at one time. 
Um, but our Lord had told the apostles, if anybody wants to see me, send them to Galilee, and I will. And, and they gathered up everybody, and that's when he appeared to everybody, over 500 people. Even the enemies of Christ believed. Even the Pharisees, the chief priests, believed. And they offered the, the bribes to the guards so that they would lie. Saying, and I love this, saying they slept while the apostles stole the body. As St. Augustine points out, how do you know what you saw if you were asleep? <laughs> and if you saw them doing it while you were asleep, why didn't you stop them? Because I was asleep. <laughs> yeah. that, the, the, the people who dispute the resurrection may, uh, make almost as many absurd claims. So the conclusion follows that Christ really died, and then he really rose from the dead, and therefore is true God. For he who says he will perform a miracle and then does it to support his claim, he has, that claim has to be true, and therefore he has to be God. Now, there are some people who make objections to this, and they're very foolish objections, obviously. Um, but, and we need to mention them and answer them because in themselves they're actual proofs of Christ's divinity. For these objections show the absurdity, the absurd lengths to which man will go in order to talk himself out of belief in a fact that stares him in the face. And here it's the resurrection, but men do that same thing, you know, all the time. You know, they you don't want to believe something like <coughs> the creation of man and woman. You want to believe in evolution. You can you can convince yourself. You can come up with all kinds of really outrageous reasons to, and that's why we're going through apologetics to show you the logical course of things <coughs> to to lay the the foundations at every level, showing how everything depends upon something else. So there is no question. But people. People will look at that and they say, "Oh, this is this is total." Somebody commented on the website, "This is total hogwash." <coughs> Obviously, you don't think you, you're not you're not a reasoning person because everything we said, everything we have said, step by step, is pure logic. Yeah, you don't have to accept it. It's you're entitled to your erroneous opinion, but you know, don't. It, you can, unless you come come forward with an argument to disprove what we've said, you can't do that. So so let's take a look at some of these arguments. First, Christ wasn't dead when he was laid in the tomb. He was just worn out and unconscious. Oh, well, he had been pierced by a lance. And he was laid in an airless tomb for 40 hours, covered with 100 pounds of very pungent spices. There was no light, no food, no water, and no air for those 40 hours. And yet he wrote, you say he was worn out. He rose to, in full strength, strong enough to roll aside a huge rock by himself, with a perfectly glorious body, Walk firmly on wounded feet eight miles to Amos and could appear and disappear at will, even through locked doors, and still be touched and even eat. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That he really wasn't dead. Another argument is that the disciples of Christ were nervously wrought up by the events of the Passion, and they knew and expected him to rise from the dead on the third day. And so this expectant, expectant attention, this expectancy, made them see visions. They, like mass hysteria, mass hypnosis sort of thing. They only fancied that they saw Christ. Um, there were 13 apparitions of Christ after the resurrection. It was not just once. And again, there were more than 500 people at one of those, and there were multiple witnesses at most of the others. Uh, we also saw that the apostles didn't actually expect the resurrection. They weren't waiting there expecting him to rise from the dead, and so they just looked at anything, you know, 
uh, a, a, a glimmer on the wall of light coming through a crack or something as Christ. They didn't expect him to rise from the dead. That was how our, our Christ's enemies expected that, but the apostles didn't. They knew that Christ foretold terrible things, and they did take them, but they didn't take them literally. They thought Christ would defeat his enemies, and when he died on Calvary, that thought it was over. The crucifixion stunned them. They were not expecting the resurrection. Christ had to keep proving to them over and over. Every time he, every time he showed up, he had to prove to them again that he wasn't a ghost, that they were not victims of any hallucination. When they were in their ships and he came walking by the, the Sea of Galilee and they saw him, he again, he asked them to bring one of their fish so that he could eat with them to prove to them again that I am not a ghost. So we conclude then that the sound, with sound human reason, can't escape the recognition of the resurrection as a fact. As the fulfillment of a prophecy and as a most astounding miracle. No one but God is master of life and death. So here we have historical and philosophical truth of a miracle. And we have no choice but to accept it as the absolute evidence of the truth both of Christ's doctrine and his mission, that Christ is God. So next week we'll look at the last proofs of again Christ's prophecy, uh, Christ in prophecy that he is uh, obviously who he claims to be. And then we'll look at his other nature, Christ as man. We, the prophecy is very short, the man part is also very short, so we should get them both done in one class. And then we will start on the next section, which is the church, because we've, 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 proved, we've proved God's existence, we've proved, therefore, religion, the necessity of religion, the necessity of a redeemer, that Christ claimed to be God, and that Christ is that redeemer. Now we have to prove, all right, that Christ founded a religion. That's the next thing that Christ founded the religion, and that is the religion that is equal to this religion that God wants. And this is where we've been going from the beginning of the class, 20-some classes into this. This is where we, we really want it to be. But you can't just jump in there. You have to prove everything in between. Just like in mathematics, you can't jump to the final equation. You have to show how you arrived at that equation. All right, so next time uh, we'll finish up on Christ's